<laughs> the, the leaf blower. <laughs> well, it's good to be with you this morning and good to see all of you as usual. I hope everybody has the elements of the Lord's Supper already. Just a heads up, we'll be doing that right after this morning's lesson. So either from home or from the table in the entryway. And then after the lesson, John will be leading us in the prayers for the Lord's Supper. And then we'll sing one song. Josh Yancey will lead us in that song. And after that, we'll get out of the building right away to do our fellowshipping outside on the front lawn. Uh, just by way of introduction, I know she's not at this service, usually at the next, uh, but I hope all of you are ultimately able to meet Elizabeth Olson. Uh, she moved down here from the church in Wapaka, Wisconsin, several hours further north, and she is uh, wanting to be a part of the congregation. Uh, she's trained to be a teacher, and so she went to school at UW-Stevens Point and lives down on the southwest side of Madison, not too far from us, near the corner of Raymond and McKenna on the southwest side. So I hope everybody gets to meet her ultimately. And uh, the elders met with her between the two services last week, and it was good getting to know her. And she gave us uh, the contact information, or we called the church in Wapaka. I called a couple of the elders, and the first elder, was na his name is Tony. And I didn't leave a message, there was no answer, so I called the next elder, whose name was also Tony, and uh, talked to that Tony, and then by the time I was done talking to that Tony, the first Tony called me back. So I've talked to two elders named Tony this week, and uh, they had nothing uh, but good to say about Elizabeth, so we're glad that she's here. As our tradition has been over the past few months, we're putting the plan of salvation on the screen. Uh, the good news is Jesus died for our sins, he was buried, he was raised up on the third day, and we respond to that by believing that message, by turning away from sin, by confessing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and then by allowing ourselves to be buried in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And at that point, we're born into God's family and the Christian life begins. And once again, we have several examples this morning. The first one comes once again from the Honolulu Hawaii Church of Christ. Angel is the young woman being baptized here. And once again, I love how all the children are gathered around the baptistry. That's a neat thing. And that is, I guess, their tradition there in Honolulu. And most of their baptisms, as here, also take place outside the worship assembly. So in the middle of the week after a Bible study, something like that. And the kids just have a way of gathering around. The next one comes from Chase Turner. Uh, he's a friend who preaches in Spanish in Monroe, Louisiana. And I'm not sure whether this is his pool or the pool of the person being baptized, but uh, that is a great use of a swimming pool in Louisiana this time of year. Uh, the third one comes from J.J. Hendricks. He's a friend who preaches at the Northwest Church of Christ in Fort Worth, Texas. This is not a picture of J.J. This is one of his fellow uh, preachers and co-workers at that congregation. I don't have the woman's name. Uh, to me, it almost looks like a wrestling match is about to begin as they figure out what to do there. But uh, that was an interesting baptism going down there. But we're thankful for this new Christian sister down in Texas. Uh, the next one is a picture of Alyssa being baptized by her grandfather at the Bybee Branch Congregation in McMinnville, Tennessee. And so what an honor that is for a grandfather to be able to baptize his granddaughter. So we're thankful for Alyssa and for her decision to obey the gospel. And the next one is a picture of Annie being baptized at the Central Congregation in Paducah, Kentucky. And this is the church where uh, Josh Yancey's parents are members. And so we're thankful for Annie's example. I think this one came in last Saturday, so I'd already had the PowerPoint together. And so this one came just over a week ago, but we added it in today. And the next one, the final one, this one comes from the Northland Church of Christ in Columbus, Ohio. It's a little bit easier to see on the... Uh, actual TV in the back than it is on the projection here. But this is a congregation in Columbus, Ohio, made up exclusively of immigrants from Ghana. And I found that to be very interesting. So everybody in that congregation is from the nation of Ghana. They've moved here through the years for various reasons. And it was actually a video. And the words spoken, the songs that were sung, were in a language that I did not understand. But you could definitely tell what was going on there. And we're thankful for this new Christian sister. Very happy picture there. 
And again, we're using these men and women as examples of what they have done over the past week or so you can do this morning. Salvation is in Jesus. Salvation is in Christ. And according to Paul in Romans 6, we are baptized into his death. And we are buried with him in baptism. So if you have any questions, if you'd like to study, uh, we would invite you to get in touch. This morning, we come to the end of our four-part series from Genesis chapter 3. You may remember that about a month or so ago, I realized that I had never in my life preached on Genesis chapter 3. And so we have fixed that. And so over the past several weeks, we've looked at Satan's role in the first sin. We've looked at the consequences of sin. We've also looked at God's statements after the first sin. And this morning we come to the end of Genesis chapter 3. And the picture on the wall up here, by the way, was taken about a week and a half ago out at Blue Mound State Park. I know many of you have been out there to do some hiking or camping. This is just west of Madison, about 20 minutes or so. Uh, we don't really go to restaurants as a family anymore, as you can understand. I do still go to Cottage Cafe by myself. I'm very quick to get in and get back out. Uh, so we've had to be more creative with uh, date nights the last few months. And on this one, we got some uh, takeout at High Point Steakhouse again down at Ridgeway. And then this time took it back to a clearing on top of Blue Mound, looking out to the north as a storm was coming in. So just a beautiful, uh, beautiful evening up there. So we're using that as our background this morning. As we look at the last few verses in Genesis 3, we now come to what happens after the fall. And we might expect that God kicks them out of the garden immediately. And he does. That will happen in this passage. But I've been reminded in my studies this week that it's not all bad. There are some good things that happen in the closing verses of Genesis chapter 3. There are some blessings here. And so as we study this morning over the next few moments, I'm hoping that we can gain something today from these last few verses, especially in terms of encouragement. We need encouragement, especially when we sin, when we do what Adam and Eve did. I think there's something here in Genesis 3 for us. And so today, let's notice what happens next. Genesis chapter 3, let's look at verses 20 through 24. As usual, I hope that you have it in your own Bible, your own device. You can follow along as we study. Uh, but for the benefit of those joining us online, we have it on the screen as well. So Genesis chapter 3, and let's look at verses 20 through 24. Now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So I hope we can learn a few things from this passage that may be of some encouragement to us today. We start in verse number 20, as Adam changes his wife's name to Eve. That's the first thing that happens here. Remember back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, when God brought the woman to Adam, Adam originally said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So now, a chapter later, after the fall, instead of being called woman because she was taken out of man, notice Adam now changes his wife's name to Eve because she is the mother of all the living. We need to ask ourselves, what is it that changes here? Why do we have verse 20? Because as we read through Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 does not seem to fit here. It doesn't really match up with the verse before it or the verse after it. And so the question I'm asking is, why the new name? Why change her name at this point? Usually in scripture, when a name is changed, something has happened. There, there's some significant event that causes the name to be changed. And of all the possibilities, why refer to her 
as the mother of all the living. That's a rather strange name to give someone, especially at this point in history. We might understand if Adam had wanted to call her temptress or bad influence or, you know, something like that, something associated with what had just happened earlier in this chapter. But instead, notice he now refers to his wife as being the mother of all the living. And this is especially strange when we realize that Eve is not yet a mother. That's rather strange. That's rather unusual, like somebody who's not a mother celebrating Mother's Day. It's not sinful. It's just a little, little strange. And so here he gives his wife a new name, a mother of all the living, even though she is not yet a mother. Well, in context, the change of name has to go back to God's promise. And that's where we go back up to verses 15 and 16, where God explains that the seed of the woman would someday bruise the serpent on the head. Not only that, but God said that the woman would experience multiplied pain in childbirth. And so I would point out, even in the curse, Adam sees a blessing. Yes, death entered the world. This is a new development here. Adam is dust, to dust he will return. And yet he also hears what God says, and he understands that children will be born. He understands that what God says will come true. And so as we look at Genesis 3.20, it seems that what Adam does here is really a statement of faith. Yes, some very terrible things are about to happen, but Adam believes in the promise that children will be born. In a sense, Adam renaming his wife is his way of saying amen to God's promise. He's saying, yes, I believe, Lord, what you have said. No longer does Adam believe Satan. Remember, Satan denied the consequences and all that, and Adam apparently blew that off. So he's no longer believing Satan, but now Adam is believing what God has said. So the change of name then, as I take it, would be a statement of his faith in God's promise. The change of name represents a change of heart on his part. Adam believes what God says here. And so first of all, even in a chapter of sin and death, we have this very positive statement of faith. And I think that's an encouragement to us. We also live in a world of sin and death, and yet we also have the promises of Jesus. And there's something to be said for agreeing with those promises. And that seems to be what Adam does here. There's a second lesson that comes after the fall. And that is we see the concept of atonement. We see the grace of God in the form of what is basically a sacrifice. Remember, what is the first thing that Adam and Eve do when they sin? This goes back up to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Even before God confronts them for what they've done, notice the first thing they do. Their eyes are open, they know that they're naked, and they sew fig leaves together, and they make themselves loin coverings. Nobody told them to do that. Their eyes were open. They understood this and they had to do something about it. They try to cover up. We understand though, and we might imagine though, that fig leaves ultimately are not very adequate. None of us are wearing fig leaves this morning because it doesn't work, right? We need something other than that. You would need to replace those every few days. They would wear out quickly. You bend over to pick up a squash and have a blowout or whatever. You know, the fig leaves are not durable. They aren't doing it. And the same goes for all the things that we might do to cover up our sins today. Maybe we just try to be good people. I'm going to work hard at what I do and try not to think about the death that's coming. Maybe we try to distract ourselves uh, with work or with something else. And yet if we're trying to cover sin, nothing that we personally do will ever get that done. It is just not adequate. Sometimes we sing about this. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill the law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. You must save and you alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Naked I come to you for dress. Helpless, I look to you for grace. Vile, I too, the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Those are the words of the song, Rock of Ages, that we sometimes sing. And it's very appropriate to what we're looking at here in Genesis chapter 3. 
So since the fig leaves aren't doing it, notice in Genesis 3.21, the Lord God makes garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothes them in this way. As an act of grace, then, God does for Adam and Eve what they had never even imagined ever doing for themselves. This is not something that crosses their mind. He makes for them garments of skin. Back when we had the scooter in our family, it was a Yamaha Zuma, and uh, we loved it and had it for a couple years. I would take it through the isthmus to get over here, never on the belt line. It would only go 40 miles an hour. Uh, but I remember doing a lot of reading on motorcycle safety and all of that. And in terms of clothing, most articles recommended another layer of skin. I don't know if you've heard that, but uh, when you're on a bike and uh, pretty much everybody's out to get you, that's the way you need to drive and protect yourself and all of that. But they would always recommend another layer of skin. And what they meant by that is leather. It's hard to beat leather for protection. And we understand this. We might wear leather gloves working in the garden. We might wear shoes that are made out of leather because leather protects and leather is durable. God then makes garments of skin for Adam and Eve. And we know what this means. This is different from fig leaves. For this garment, an animal had to die. And that was a gruesome process. That's something the world had never seen up to this point. A sacrifice is made. This animal, in a sense, dies as a substitute. The animal serves as atonement. We read the word atonement over and over in Scripture, and the word that we translate as atonement, by the way, it goes back to a word referring to something being covered, something being covered. Adam and Eve are covered, literally, by this animal that gives its life in this process. And again, as far as we know, this is the first time this happens. An innocent animal's life is taken in order to cover sin. So Adam and Eve make the decision to sin, but an innocent animal dies in their place to cover the consequences or to make it okay, we might say. And how traumatic this must have been. We can hardly imagine. We know what it means today for animals to die. Some of you go hunting and we eat meat and, and so on and so on. So Adam and Eve sin and this animal dies for them. Up to this point, Adam and Eve are living together with the animals. We know from earlier in this book that Adam was given the job of naming the animals based on characteristics that they had, so we had to get to know them in a sense. But all along, they're almost like pets. There's, there's no animosity, there's no fear or you know, threat between people and animals. But now God apparently kills an animal, guts it, skins it, and gives those skins to Adam and Eve to replace the fig leaves that they were trying to use to cover their sin and that wasn't working. This, of course, looks forward to future sacrifices. In fact, the next chapter, by the time we get to Genesis 4, Cain and Abel are offering sacrifices. Cain's sacrifice from his crops is rejected by God, but Abel's animal sacrifice is accepted, which is interesting. Uh, the next book over in Exodus, we come to the Passover lamb that was sacrificed in order to protect the people from the angel. Uh, just as Adam and Eve were covered by that first death, now also we have Jesus described by Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 as our Passover. So we are covered by the sacrifice of Jesus. He died for us. He died in our place. He is our atonement. He is our covering. His blood covers our sins. And today we put on Christ in the act of baptism. As Paul explains in Galatians 3.27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That's what we're talking about here. There is an atonement, a covering that takes place. In Revelation 7:14, the saved are pictured as those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So Jesus is our righteousness, and we put him on in baptism. In an act of grace then, God provides atonement through sacrifice. And from here on, this is the theme of the entire Bible. These leather garments, by the way, actually prepare Adam and Eve for what happens next. Life in a less than perfect world of thorns and thistles 
and difficult work. So let's continue. And we noticed in the last few verses that God forcibly removes Adam and Eve from the garden in what is actually an act of mercy. Because by removing their access to the tree of life, God puts a limit on sin. Starting in verse 22, in order to limit access to the tree of life, notice in verse 23, God sends them out. And in verse 24, he drives them out. That is a forcible eviction, isn't it? They do not want to go, but God forces them to go. He makes them leave. Years ago, we had a member here who had been a bouncer at a bar in Milwaukee in a previous life. And uh, he was able to get some things like that done. And uh, he's not somebody I would want to cross in a physical sense like that. But that's the picture I have in my mind in verse 24, a bouncer. Adam and Eve are almost literally thrown out. God makes them, he evicts them, he, he throws them out of the garden. Now, obviously, at first reading, this is an act of judgment. And there is an act of punishment going on here. But I would also point out that there is an act of mercy here on God's part. Because if Adam and Eve had had ongoing access to the tree of life, they would have lived forever in a state of continual sin and rebellion, and there would have been no end to it. And so he gives them some time to think about what they've done. It's not instantaneous death, but it drags out over a period of time. There's some punishment, but there's also a limit to it. To put it in terms we can understand, instead of taking away our child's cell phone as punishment, this would be the equivalent of taking away the charger. It's not an instant punishment, but it's dragged out over a couple days as they see that battery life going down and down. They have time to uh, think about that. And so that seems to be what happens here. There's time for regret and reflection and repentance over a number of years. And ultimately, this is for their own good. Sin is limited. We can hardly imagine the most evil people on this earth living forever. There have been some evil people in world history, haven't there been? Imagine some of those most evil people living for eternity. This would be just a, a horrific place to live. Without access to the tree of life, all of us will die. And in that sense, sin is limited. I know we keep seeing statistics on the pandemic, but one thing we might forget sometimes is that the death rate for all of us is 100%, isn't it? All of us will die. All of us will die of some point of something. Adam lives for a long time. I think if we were to keep reading, I believe Adam lives for about 930 years. That's a long life of hard work and, and so on. He raises many children. He feels the weight of sin over those years. But ultimately, there is a limit on it, and he does not live in that condition forever. To prevent Adam and Eve from going back to the garden, notice God stations cherubim at the gate angels with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. The cherubim seem to be the beings in scripture who limit access to God's presence. They are the bouncers, so to speak, if we continue that picture. They show up again as carvings over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place in the tabernacle and then in the temple. We find them around the throne of God in Ezekiel and again in Revelation. Images of cherubim are woven into the curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies. This is the curtain that is torn in two from top to bottom when Jesus dies on the cross, indicating access to the throne has been reopened. But Adam and Eve's removal from the garden is an act of mercy in that the tree of life is guarded, but it is not destroyed. God could have eliminated the tree of life at this point, but he doesn't. He guards it and he protects it so they do not have access to it. In fact, the tree of life shows up again in heaven many years later in Revelation 22, where John says, Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse, 
and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. So God is a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy. It's mercy limiting our time on this earth. In mercy, he gives us time to prepare for the life to come. And in mercy, he explains how to find our way back to the tree of life. By the way, the song that Josh picked out for us to sing in just a little bit is Footprints of Jesus. And I found it interesting in the last or next to the last verse in that song, that song refers to heaven's golden street. I don't know if you realize this, many of our songs refer to the streets of heaven, but what I just read from Revelation refers to the street in heaven. So as I understand it, there's one street. I don't know how that works, but I just found it interesting that the song that we sing this morning gets it right. There's one street in heaven and there is this river and the tree of life in heaven. So I'm thankful for that song. This morning then we've looked at what happens after the fall. We've seen some words of encouragement. Yes, it's bad. Some very bad things happen in Genesis 3. But we've seen here that Adam believes God's promises. In an act of grace, God provides a more permanent covering. That's the second lesson. And then in his mercy, God does not destroy the tree of life, but he takes it away temporarily. He limits access to it. And ultimately, he allows us to find our way back to it. And that is the message of the rest of the Bible. Before John leads us in the prayers for the Lord's Supper, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and only awesome God of heaven and earth, creator of Adam and Eve. Thank you for providing a way for sin to be covered, not by our own feeble efforts, but by the perfect life and sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Thank you for providing a way back to the tree of life. We're living in a world of suffering under the curse of sin. We look around us and we're reminded every day that this world is not our permanent home. In this world of sin and violence and hatred and death, we ask that you would allow us as your people to be salt and light. We ask that you would allow us to do good and to share because we know that with these sacrifices, you are pleased. Thank you for Jesus. We come to you this morning in his name. Lord, come quickly. Amen. As Baxter pointed out in, in the lesson, there's nothing that we can do to cover our sins. The only thing that can cover our sins is the blood of Christ. And on the night before he was nailed to the cross, he was with his disciples. And he instituted a memorial at that point to help us remember that fact and to remind us of his sacrifice and his blood. And now we have the opportunity to partake in that to help get our minds around that. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 26. This is Jesus. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your care for us. We thank you that you have provided a way for us to cover our sins through your son's sacrifice and our obedience to your word. We pray, Father, that we will be ever mindful of this sacrifice and that we will try to live our lives in such a way that will be pleasing to you that first we would obey your word and be baptized and live faithful to your word all of our days 
Help us now, Father, as we partake of this bread to remember Christ's body that was nailed to the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Likewise, our Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that reminds us of Christ's blood that was shed on our behalf. We pray, Father, that we would partake in a manner pleasing in your sight. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I think we're all in the habit now, but as a quick reminder, after this song, we're done. Head outside. We can fellowship out there. Um, we'll be singing all four verses of Footprints of Jesus together. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard thee calling, come, follow me, and we see where thy footprints falling, lead us to thee, footprints of Jesus, that We will follow. 